Uh, I'm Andrew Smith. I'm a partner at the law firm of Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. We represent banks and other financial services companies um, with respect to retail and wholesale financial services questions. I've been in the business for the last 20 years or so, um, primarily focusing on um, on trade practices and other consumer financial services questions. I counsel uh, companies like Experian and others on legal issues. Well, I think that generally speaking, so if we're thinking about marketplace lending, I think it's important for us first to define that term. And honestly, I have a difficult time defining it because it seems to encompass an awful lot of different business activity. So as an example, a marketplace lender might be a company like Prosper or Lending Club, um, or the, which uh, works with investors to fund loans for consumers. It might be a company that um, extends credit to consumers or to small businesses on its own account and actually holds those loans in its own portfolio. It might securitize those loans to investors. It might sell those loans into the secondary market. It might partner with a bank to engage in that business activity. Um, and in fact, sometimes this is not even, these aren't even loans at all, but it's a different form of financing called merchant cash advance, where, uh, which is prevalent in the small business space. So there are a lot of different business models. And if you think about the regulatory challenges, I think that the regulatory challenges are the same as they have been for the last 40 or 50 years with respect to, um, with respect to the sale of, of credit to consumers and to small businesses. The difference is that these marketplace lenders are typically conducting business online. So you may have unique challenges with respect to the marketing of loans online. For example, if you're dealing with lead generators um, or you're dealing with or you're selling loans indirectly, for example, through uh, an ISO or a payment processor, um, there may be issues with respect to the origination of loans online. Um, how do you underwrite the loans online? How do you obtain information from companies like Experian online and incorporate that into your underwriting process and do so quickly enough because, again, it's the Internet and consumers can click that close button on the browser whenever they want, do this all quickly enough so that the consumers don't abandon the transaction. So there are unique challenges posed by the online environment, but I think that the laws that we have already are up to the task. There are several issues that are not well settled in the law right now. And I think that the most serious of those revolve around what I will refer to as the true lender question. So let's say that you are not a bank. Um, you're someone who sells credit to consumers over the internet. Um, but you partner with a bank to do that. And you, the non-bank, you might market the loans, you might help the bank with underwriting, you might purchase the loans you know, from the bank after the bank funds the loans. So the bank holds the loans on its books for one or two days and then you purchase the loans from them, from the bank. Um, there are some, there is some case law where courts have looked at an arrangement like that and said, the bank's not the real lender here, the bank's not the true lender, it's the non-bank partner who's the true lender, they're the ones who are doing all the heavy lifting with respect to this. They're the ones who are marketing the loans and providing the, the technology to underwrite the loans and purchasing the loans from the bank at the end of the day. Um, and that's a, that's a frightening concept because there is banks, because, as a function of federal law, um, don't need to comply with state licensing and usury laws. And of course, there's a patchwork of 50 different states, 50 different sets of legal requirements. Banks can loan on a national scale. Partnering with a bank allows uh, a loan program to operate nationally. Um, if it turns out, though, that in fact the non-bank is the true lender, not the bank, now suddenly that non-bank is subject to all of those state laws. And some of those state laws are criminal. For example, in the state of New York, there's a, if you loan above 25% and you're not a bank, you might be guilty of criminal usury, which is, you know, being led away in handcuffs. And that's the kind of thing that I think is, um, 
most vexing for people who are operating in the space. Because on the internet, the, the promise of the internet is to provide you with a national platform to reach your customers. Um, and, and, this, and the patchwork of state laws really can work to stymie that. So here's an interesting aspect of marketplace lending. So with marketplace lending, and again, it's, you know, we're talking very broadly. Marketplace lending really uh, depends on who you talk to, to, you know, the definition can be very, very broad. Um, it can encompass just about all online lending. Um, there's a lot of talk about marketplace lenders using non-traditional data to underwrite consumers in particular. Non-traditional data might be, let's, as an example, might be social media data. Um, you know, how many friends do you have on Facebook? You know, and deter making loan decisions on that basis. Th this is in, in, the, in the trade press frequently, and there's a lot of discussion in the lending industry about the proper use of this non-traditional data. It, of course, raises fair lending concerns. Um, you want to make sure that whatever data you use doesn't discriminate against credit applicants on, a, on an impermissible basis. But there's another aspect of the use of non-traditional data too, which I think is really interesting. And it really is not so much a legal issue, it's an issue of, I'll call it palatability, that the use of these non-traditional variables may not be something that consumers will understand and appreciate. It might be something that consumers, that will create a consumer relations problem for you. So as an example, when you deny credit to an individual, you are required to send them a letter saying we've denied credit and here are the reasons why. So what would be the reason codes for some of this non-traditional data? As in my example of you know, friends on underwriting based on the number of friends on Facebook, would the reason code be you don't have enough friends on Facebook? And I think that that's sometimes where the rubber meets the road. Even if we can get ourselves comfortable with the fact that these non-traditional variables don't discriminate impermissibly, how are we going to provide consumers with that needed level of transparency? Well, so I'm a big booster of credit bureaus, and in particular, national credit bureaus like Experian, who have a tremendous amount of data about all of us and our credit experiences. And, um, and for the most part, my hunch is that 99% of that data or more is positive data. And uh, products like Experian's uh, allow, facilitate what I'll refer to as the miracle of instant credit. That's a term that was used by the Federal Trade Commission many years ago. So, but it essentially means on a Saturday afternoon, I can go out shopping for a car and I can drive off the lot with a brand new car on a Saturday afternoon in the space of about 20 minutes. Why is that? It's because of Experian. It's because Experian, the car dealer doesn't know me from Adam, but I'm able to walk in. They're able to pull a report on me and see that I'm a credit worthy individual. And that powers this thriving consumer financial services economy that we have in this country. And it's very important if marketplace lenders want to play and that want to benefit from that same ease of access to information, that same comprehensiveness of information, it's important that they also, that they play a role in that and that they contribute to that as well. And another thing, it's also the right thing to do by their customers because it enables their customers to build credit. And yes, it may enable their customers to find credit with another lender. Um, but at the end of the day, the expectation of regulators and, and consumer advocates and legislators and everyone else is that responsible financial institutions furnish information to credit bureaus so that consumers can build a positive credit record and, and improve and broaden their opportunities um, with respect to access to financial services.